Hello, and thank you for visiting my channel. Today, I would like to share my experience and thoughts on traveling on United Airlines. In September 2024, I traveled from Phoenix Sky Harbor Airport in Arizona through Houston George Bush Airport to Amsterdam Schiphol Airport. My first leg was United Airlines Flight 2025 from Phoenix to Houston. The boarding process went smoothly for the on-time departure at 10.30 a.m. I made a last-minute seat change after I checked in on the app and moved to an emergency exit seat. The reason was that this flight looked pretty full and I knew the overhead space would be limited and I might have to put my Flights backpack under the seat in front of me, today. which I did. In, in order to avoid to being cramped and uncomfortable, and I decided to pay some extra and move to the exit row which looked wide open at the time I made the change. This turned out to be a very good decision as I was able to sit comfortably for a two and a half hour flight. And luckily, the middle seat remained empty, which made a big difference in terms of comfort. The plane departed the gate even a few minutes you ahead of schedule. For your loyalty and to all customers for choosing to fly with us today. Our entire United team is here to make sure you have a great flight. Now we're ready for takeoff into the beautiful sunny Arizona sky. This is my favorite moment of flying as the aircraft lifts itself into the sky. In addition to the extra legroom to be enjoyed, the window exit row has another merit that because it is sitting over the wings, it is less prone to turbulence. But, of course, you have to be able to speak English reasonably well and be willing and able to assist the crew in case of emergency. As we got to the cruising altitude, they came through with beverage and snack service. There was a choice of pretzels or chocolate cookie. I got orange juice and the cookie. This flight was smooth, uneventful, and pretty enjoyable for the most part. United Airlines has a special place in my memory of flying. It was my first domestic flight in the United States from Los Angeles to Chicago. But my very first flying experience was actually just prior to that domestic flight, traveling from Tokyo to Los Angeles on Singapore Airlines when I was just 17 years old in the mid-1980s. Yes, I will admit that I'm that old. I was also traveling by myself and was very nervous. I didn't even know how to fasten the seatbelt. But I do remember sitting in the big Boeing 747, feeling the ecstatic sensation of the power and thrust of takeoff. I thought I was going to heaven. I arrived in Los Angeles in the morning 
That same night, I flew red eye on United from LA to Chicago and to Newark. Then, two days later, from Newark to Denver to Phoenix. That was a great flying experience for a 17 year old first timer. Now, the plane is already approaching Houston. Houston is now one of United's main hubs, but it used to be a hub for Continental Airlines. I remember flying with Continental Airlines across the Pacific near the end of the Persian Gulf War in 1991. No one was flying there. There were maybe 50 passengers in the entire Boeing 747. The plane was virtually empty. Cottonell Airline had also filed bankruptcy in December of 1990, just prior to my trip. My travel agency warned me about their situation just before the departure day and that they could not guarantee the airlines will operate through my trip. That scared the heck out of me. I'm glad they kept operating though. Eventually, Continental Airlines would merge with United in 2010. Throughout the 90s, I flew with United pretty frequently. They used to give you 100% of the mileage actually flown, so you fly a round trip between the United States East Coast and Japan, you received about 13,000 miles even on the cheapest ticket. So, even though I was not a frequent business traveler or anything like that, I was enjoying their premier status for a little while. Well, the plane landed just about 10 minutes early. I had about an hour and 40 minutes layover, so I had plenty of time for connection. My next leg is a long haul, nine and a half hour flight to Amsterdam. I was pretty excited about this flight. I hadn't flown international on United since 2001. My last international flight on United was when I traveled from Washington, D.C. to Sydney, Australia, less than one month after 9 11. Not many people were flying there, and all the airlines were still scrambling to figure out what to do about security, let alone surviving through that difficult time. I remember going through the international security checkpoint at San Francisco Airport. The Asian female officer detected something in my carry on bag, opened it up, and dug through everything into my toiletry bag. Found one little razor blade cartridge for shaving. She said, This one, no. So I had to throw it away. Everyone had to open their carry on bag and take everything out for inspection at the security checkpoint. This was the same at Sydney Airport, also. I also remember a slight change in the meal service. They were still using metal cutlery then, but the knife was changed to plastic. It was awkward holding a metal fork in one hand and a plastic knife in the other. Of course, nowadays it's all plastic anymore. We're now arriving at Gate C9, which is a domestic terminal. This is the International Terminal E. I took a sky train from Terminal C, which was very easy. I found this airport quite pleasant, bright and airy with high ceiling and open space. However, there was some heavy construction going on and some parts of it were ugly. My next flight was departing from gate E7. I got there with time to spare. The crowd at the boarding gate area didn't seem to be so huge for a Boeing 777. I thought maybe this flight isn't very full. Soon, it was time to board. The seat I chose for this flight was a window seat in the back of the plane. There are a few reasons for that. The economy class seating configuration in this Boeing 777 is 343. Except the two rows in the very back are 242, which means fewer people and more space in the overhead bins. However, keep in mind that two of the bins on the left side, for seats A and B of the plane, are locked for crew use and not available for passengers, so the right side is definitely a better choice. Even though the fuselage is narrowing towards the back, the aisle is wider for those rows. So it is less cramped. I usually choose a window seat for obvious reasons. 
because it is away from the wings, you get a great view from the window. Settling in my seat and checking around, I have a personal entertainment screen, a tray table, a seat pocket, and the living room is pretty decent. I also check the tray table to make sure it's working properly and reasonably clean. It is not a fold-out type, but just one piece due to the rather bulky latch mechanism. And I noticed that the table was noticeably small. A small 13-inch laptop could barely sit on it. If you have anything larger, I doubt if you could use it comfortably. There's a USB charging port under the screen, and there is also a universal plug outlet between the seats. The entertainment system works pretty well. The touch screen is responsive. And I think there's a good amount of contents, but personally, I usually don't watch long movies or play games or do anything that engages my eyes on the screen intensively. It tires my eyes. I'm a classical music fan, and I'm perfectly fine just listening to classical music with my noise-canceling earphones and looking at the flight map from time to time. Unfortunately though, the selection of classical music was rather poor, but that's okay. I can always find something that can keep me calm. We will be calm. Well, looks like boarding is complete, and it turned out that this flight wasn't full at all. There were a lot of empty seats, and people were starting to spread out. I had an empty seat next to me, so my window seat also had free access to the aisle. They handed out earphones and sanitizing wipe. I used the wipe to clean the tray table, but didn't use the earphones as I had my own noise-canceling earphones. The plane departed the gate a few minutes ahead of schedule. I guess the boarding didn't take as long as it would have if it had been full. I guess I had made a right decision on my seat choice. The back area of the plane is generally unpopular, so if there are empty seats like this flight, more of them tend to be in the back area. I imagine the front area of the economy section was not as empty as here in the back. Well, we are ready for takeoff. A few more words on my seat choice. Some say that the back of the plane is more prone to turbulence. But I can only sit in one spot and there is no way I can compare. I would know the difference. Some say the proximity to the galley and lavatory may be bothersome. But the window seat is just enough away from the aisle that it wouldn't bother me. Besides, I hardly saw anyone walking through my aisle to access the back lavatory. It is true that the meal cart would get to the back row at the last, and there may not be any choice left. But, honestly, I didn't care. And in the end, because there were so many empty seats, I didn't have a choice. And lastly, if you have to pay to choose your seat like I did, it costs the least amount to select the seat in the very back. So, in terms of seat choice, I couldn't have been happier. Back to my flying history. Less than a year after my trip to Sydney, my mother died in the summer of 2002. I received the news around midnight and I needed to travel to Tokyo as soon as possible. Since my preference was United, I called them first right away but no one answered. I called American and Delta and no one was answering. Finally, the only airlines that even answered the phone was Northwest and they gave me a bereavement fare. Remember, that was not the time when people just booked airline tickets on the app any time of the day. So I stopped using United. By the way, I was also lucky to have such an amazing weather to enjoy this window view. Okay, let's talk about other amenity and in-flight service. In addition to the earphones and sanitizing wipe, they gave you a blanket and a pillow. Pretty standard. I do like this pillow. It's designed to be a neck pillow and it stays around your neck, which is nice. I also use the other pillow for the empty seat next to me as my lower back support. 
Shortly after takeoff, they offered a bag of pretzels and a beverage. I got a cup of red wine. I thought they'd give you a whole miniature bottle, but I guess not. Almost an hour later, a meal was served. Honestly though, look at the size of the tray as compared to the tray table which I had already noticed was small. And a bag of cookies bigger than the rest of the meal was meant to be your dessert. They asked me, chicken or pasta? And this is a chicken. But again, more than half of it was, guess what, pasta, mac and cheese. I honestly wonder what the pasta option was, or was it a joke? Later, they gave me this tiny bottle of water. There was no coffee or tea service. It's truly sad that this has become the standard of international in-flight service. Okay, time for some reflection. Um, up until the 1990s, international air travel was glamorous and there was a certain sense of prestige. At least, that's how they treated you and made you feel. To buy an airline ticket, you call up a travel agent and receive personal service. It really felt like uh, someone was taking care of you. You show up at the airport and you're greeted with a smile. You check your luggage and got your boarding pass. I also used to get there early and ask for an emergency exit seat. And they would give it to you, all free of course. You get on board and the flight attendants would always have a smile on their face, talk to you with polite language and caring attitude. There was no personal entertainment like we have today. You get a headset that looks like a stethoscope, very uncomfortable to wear, and the audio quality was horrible. And there were just a few audio channels. The in-flight service was the entertainment, and that is what made the international flying so exciting to me. Once you're on board, you get a menu card with a description of your meals that looks like a multi-course fine dining. I remember in the 90s, Delta was offering three choices of entree, beef, chicken, or fish. Food was served in porcelain dishes with metal cutlery. The dinner time lasted about an hour. I used to get really full after eating, and I was young and a big appetite then. I think in a way, the economy class meal back then was better than the business class meal today. After the meal, they would announce that they would be showing a movie and ask to pull down the window shades. And then they would pull a big screen down uh, along the wall. You can set the audio to channel 3 if you want to watch the movie. The whole cabin turns into a movie theater. There will be a mid-flight snack consisting of a sandwich and fruit. And prior to arrival, there will be another full meal. By the end of the flight, I would be really full. Around Christmas of 2002, I flew with American Airlines from JFK to Tokyo. By that time, the airlines had reduced the in-flight service so dramatically to cut costs and survive in the aftermath of 9-11. I looked at the meal tray they put in front of me and thought it was a joke. The tray was full size, but there was so much empty space on it. I honestly thought that you can't call this a meal. This is just a few samples of food for you to taste. At the end of this 14-hour flight, I arrived in Tokyo hungry. I remember the days when they used to serve full hot meals on a US domestic flight, but 9-11 changed all that. While well, speaking of hungry, about an hour before landing, they finally came through with this pre-arrival snack. I got an egg and cheese sandwich. Again, no yogurt, fruit, or anything else. On this nine and a half hour flight, I had only eaten that tiny meal at the beginning, no mid-flight anything, so this was quite disappointing, but that's pretty much the standard these days. Well, at least I got a cup of coffee so I can stay awake for the landing. Since mid-2000s, after that experience with American Airlines, I decided to stay away from American carriers when traveling international and tried different airlines from different countries. Air Canada, WestJet, Lufthansa, Swiss, Portuguese, TAP, British Airways, Aer Lingus, Iberia, Air France, KLM, Finnair, SAS, Turkish Airlines, ANA, Japan Airlines, Asiana Airlines, Cathay Pacific, Thai Airways, Emirates, Qatar, South African, etc., etc. 
it's all been very interesting. Even during those 10 or 15 years, I have observed noticeable changes in products and services in airlines. Well, you could gripe about the declines in airline service, but when it comes down to it, I guess what's most important is to get to your destination safely. I am happy to be able to travel at all, especially after COVID. The plane has now come down under the clouds and we are starting to see the city of Amsterdam. These beautiful window views are the best part of flying, in my opinion. The plane landed about half an hour ahead of schedule. I think I got about four hours of sleep altogether, which is not bad. It was about 8.30 in the morning local time, so I had a full day ahead of me. I have avoided American carriers for a long time for international travel, but I'm kind of glad I did it this time. It brought back a lot of memories. About this particular flight, First of all, it was excellent on-time performance and even early arrival. I had a comfortable seat and the entire flight was smooth, safe and uneventful. The crew did their job fine. Really, there was nothing wrong. Would I fly United again? Well, it depends. If I was flying to Japan, I guess I would prefer ANA or JL. If I was flying to Europe, I would prefer Lufthansa or Swiss, or I might even try a new airline such as Polish LOT or Taiwanese EVA, just out of curiosity. Every trip, every flight is a new adventure for me. As this flight is coming to an end, I am excited to find out what's waiting for me in this beautiful city of Amsterdam and beyond. Thank you so much for watching and listening.